Right now, here in Beijing, the annual meetings of the National People's Congress, China's legislature, and the Chinese People's Political Consultative Conference, China's advisory body, together called the two sessions, are confronting a constellation of complex structural problems. But no one here is talking about China's collapse, not even privately. Why then is China's collapse an idea of interest in the foreign media? What are its arguments? Who are its advocates? Why does it resonate? More importantly, what are China's complex structural problems? How are they being addressed? What are the obstacles? What are the risks? Moreover, what are the implications for the world? Why should foreigners care about China's annual two sessions political meetings? I argue they must to be closer to China. In this year's two sessions, the NPC and CPPCC, Premier Li Keqiang's annual government work report stated that GDP in 2015 reached 67.7 trillion yuan, or about 10.4 trillion U.S. dollars, at current exchange rates, an increase of 6.9 percent from 2014. For 2016, the economic growth target has been set at 6.5 to 7 percent. This growth target is close to a trillion dollars. In addition, the average national growth rate for the next five years has also been set at above 6.5 percent, which means additional GDP of a trillion dollars or more every year through 2020. Central to the plan, macroeconomic policies and supply-side structural reform will be stressed and strengthened. This includes proactive and prudent monetary policy, keeping the deficit at 2.18 trillion yuan and the deficit to GDP ratio at 3 percent tackling industrial overcapacity, especially in the steel and coal industries, and improving the performance of state-owned enterprises. I speak with Professor Xu Hong Tsai, Director of the Economic Research Department, China Center for International Economic Exchanges, and Dr. Tang Min, economist and counselor to the State Council. What were the economic highlights of the government work report? What are your first observations? This year's government work report has some differences from previous years. Usually, there is a summary of government work in the past year and the general planning for the work next year. But as this year marks the beginning of the 13th five-year plan, the summary is not just about last year, but also about the past five years altogether. It's about how we are completing the targets set in the 12th five-year plan. Looking ahead, there is plan not just for coming year, but also for the next five years as well. This is hugely different from other years' reports. In terms of economics, I see new development concepts being launched for implementation. And among the five major concepts, innovation is the top priority. As China's economy enters a new normal, traditional economic boosters start to lose their impact. For example, we used to reap huge economic benefits from a large supply of human labor, low-cost energy consumption, and exports. But now, these engines fail to work as efficiently as they did. Demographic dividends, dividends from the technological advancement, innovation in mechanisms, institutions and business models, etc., are bound to bring about complicated issues. Therefore, by the end of last year, the Central Economic Working Conference issued measures to implement the five major tasks for both this year and the coming years. In the meantime, suggestions have been put forward for the 13th five-year plan. Based on them, the State Council updates the 13th five-year plan for the two sessions' discussion and deliberation. Generally speaking, this year's government work report is more inclusive and has more detailed plans compared with those of previous years. I believe such a design is highly critical for sustainable development over the next five years. In 2015, China's GDP growth rate was 6.9 percent, the slowest expansion in a quarter of a century. This seemed to reinforce the China's collapse theory, which in recent years has become more prominent. Collapse points to China's many problems, slowing growth, social imbalances, industrial overcapacity, overbuilt housing, excessive debt, market volatilities, massive pollution, insufficient state-owned enterprise reform, and so on. 
Indeed, the economy is slowing down as the country aims for more sustainable growth, stressing quality, not quantity of growth, such as improved social programs, reducing pollution, and addressing economic imbalances. The problems and challenges are real. But is the China's collapse theory valid? How do you uh, analyze that so-called theory, the China collapse theory? Right. Uh, China collapse theory is always there, sometimes higher, sometimes lower, right? Uh, as an economist, we know uh, there are always a small group of economists. They always the collapse, collapse. Not only in China, the world collapse, the right, U.S. Right, economy right, right, right. crisis. One day they're right. Yeah, right, <laughs> right you keep right. saying, and right. I mean your life. It's like a, a, right? cl a clock that stopped. It's right <laughs> twice a day. Yeah, twice a day. <laughs> so they always they always a small group of things. Right. right? And secondly, at this moment. The more people talk me then, yeah, and it's true because China, uh, China economy come to the, the very critical period. I really come to a stage of big reforms. You cannot do a little modify this and then you can solve the problem. Really come to big reform. Those problems, as you mentioned, that it's true. That's nobody, nobody deny for that. And even Chinese government, you take a look at government uh, reporting and sure, the sure. prime minister's report, right? And all is there, and. Uh, but where they have a big collapse, where they have a big crisis, that's a story, right? And if you take a look at uh, the challenge, nowadays, not only China, all the countries not bigger challenge than before. Uh,一方面呢,确确实实,给人们感觉上,好像你的经济速度下来了,现在只有6.5到7.0了。on the one hand, people feel the economy is slowing, with a growth rate ranging from 6.5% to 7%, compared with 10% in the past. But essentially, this is not a real story, because we have a much larger base now of 67.7 trillion RMB. An increase of 6.5% to 7% is actually big. Our contribution to newly created wealth in the world economy last year was around 26%, adding a new capital pool of 500 billion US dollars, which even places us ahead of the United States. But on the other hand, we should be aware of great expectations from the world over. China has indeed become an engine of global economic growth. Any fluctuations in China's market will ripple across other countries with severe impact. Therefore, with the asymmetric information flow, some people who do not really understand China may feel concerned. I feel it is understandable. But to my understanding, I think we're pretty confident of maintaining such medium to high speed growth of around 6.5% to 7%. There will be not of any hard landing of China's economy or collapse. One thing I, I'd like to e even get defined if for, right. by an economist is what, is what does even collapse mean? What, what, is, exactly. what, what does collapse mean? Yeah. Is it, does it mean a, mm -hmm. a, 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 a recession, g g growth mm -hmm. less than zero? Does it mean yeah. you know mm -hmm. chaos in the streets? Exactly. I mean, the definition of collapse, it's sort of exactly. an English term that uh, it has emotional excitement to it. Exactly. Uh, but, but what does it literally mean? Yeah. How do economists it's interpret that? It's very confused. Nobody, Nobody tell, knows, yeah. right? Yeah. If I use uh, in the next standard norm, yeah. Uh, if getting economic recession, then called the collapse. But the recession means at least two quarters get negative growth. Yeah, yeah, right. In China, you can cannot predict the next few years. You can see some negative growth. Right. Right? Maybe right. it's six percent, maybe seven percent, even five percent. Uh, that's still five percent. Sure, what, what, sure, what the class, sure. Right? So unless they say redefine if. China economy below six percent, that means a collapse. Then yeah, but, but that's possible, right? Yeah, but you yeah. wouldn't say that in, in, in the US. Exactly. I mean, even if the US goes through a recession, which it had negative yeah. growth for two quarters, nobody yeah. says that's collapse. Yes. Because they say it's a recession. Yeah. <laughs> they don't use yeah. the term collapse. Even, yeah, in recession is different than collapse. Right, right. right. As an economist, if you mm -hmm. were sitting in a debate with somebody who was arguing for China's collapse, what would be the categories of information that you would use to show that, that the Chinese economy is not collapsing? It may go through the various problems. What are the, what are the core kinds of, uh, of, of arguments that you would give? Right. First, I want to clarify what they mean of a collapse. 
Right. Because without this debating, without definition, then right. we're difficult to debate. <laughs> they, they're using that term, my user, my term, and it's difficult uh, to debate that, right? So, number one, I was asking, please define what <laughs> in your mind of the collapse, whether I agree using <laughs> this term, right? Yeah. And then I can make a one by one to do an analysis. You said economic growth will be slowing down. I said, agree, <laughs> right? But you said negative. I said, no, let's, let's analyze why you think about it. Well, <laughs> you, you, you will be negative, right. Goes, right? You think of capital flight. Oh, the Chinese will have a capital flight. You take a look in uh, uh, Indonesia or Malaysia and, uh, and during the Asian crisis. I said, okay, if you are your large capital fly or reserve suddenly dropping, that called a collapse. Okay, then we can do analysis, <laughs> right? Chinese government is very strong control, right? It's not, they never claims that we are free, convertible, right? If government want to control, they can easily control. They can capture or uh, uh, capital fly. But we have to distinguish capital fly and uh, we call the overseas investment, right? If, uh, for, uh, if an overseas investment, uh, expanding market, uh, if for the business, the uh, business uh, profit driven, Go ahead. China do not need so much reserves. Mm. China need a bigger market. China entrepreneur need a better, uh, a be better opportunities. But capital fly means that people get a panic and, and government have a, uh, uh, a lot of facility to stop this. Mm. I'm not saying 100% every dollar we control. No, of course. Largely control. Of course. <laughs> Well, indeed, there are some thorny problems. For each of the five major tasks, including reducing overcapacity, destocking, deleveraging, reducing cost, and shoring up the weak spots, great efforts need to be exerted. Nothing comes easy, but we are confident that we are capable enough of addressing them. To give you an example, we try to destock the real estate market in third and fourth tier cities with policies like targeted regulation to create reasonable demand. At the same time, by adjusting economic structures in different regions, promoting belt and road strategies, and coordinating development in Beijing, Tianjin, and Hebei, as well as other regions, we explore opportunities for new industrial sectors to stimulate the development of a new type of urbanization. In this process, more people will be employed and see their incomes rise. Naturally, they will buy some of the unsold homes. On the other hand, as we try to reduce overcapacity, particularly in the low and coal and steel industry, we will force certain zombie companies out of the game due to their poor performance. Raising the budget deficit is in line with the demand for supply-side reform. Outlined in last year's Economic Work Conference, the budget is based on the principle of adequately raising the budget deficit rate so that the economy can maintain a mid to high growth rate. This aims at avoiding a slide of the economy and to focus on structural reforms. We have full ability to keep the Chinese economy operating within a reasonable range. We are full of confidence in the prospects for growth. I can say that the Chinese economy will absolutely not have a hard landing. So-called hard landing predictions will absolutely be shown to be empty. Let me give you some of the critiques that I hear both uh, internationally and some privately in China. And there are two kinds of critiques. One is that the growth rate numbers that we see are not reflective of reality. Point two says that, yes, the GDP may be growing, but a lot of it is, is purchasing uh, uh, inefficient assets. So two questions. One is the legitimacy of the numbers. And the second is the quality of the growth. In our economic development, imbalances do exist. Some sectors fire better than others. For example, manufacturing, the second industry, generally experienced a dip. If you look at its size and volume, 
industrial added value was only about 6 percent, which is seemingly inconsistent with the 6.9 percent GDP growth. But we should be aware of the soaring service industry, which contributed more than 50 percent to GDP growth. Its increase was about 8 percent, making it a much greater contributor. Then the high-tech industry and others have also experienced a robust development with the improved economic structure. From such analysis, we see that some sectors grew slowly and others even registered negative growth. The growth of investment in third and fourth tier cities was near zero and will perhaps even shift towards negative in the future. That's true. But in many other areas, there is a fairly rapid growth rate. For example, our investment in infrastructure last year grew at around 16 percent. That made up for the free fall of the property market and the manufacturing sector. So development among different sectors is not balanced, but on the whole, the economic structure is improving. So far, consumption's contribution to economic growth is already more than 66 percent, which was barely seen in previous years. We're happy to see the situation looking up. In addition, there are indications that economic quality is improving. Our energy consumption per unit of GDP, including carbon emission and others, is changing for the better. Targets set in the 12th five-year plan were achieved. Therefore, if we look at the big picture with a comprehensive viewpoint, our economy is looking up indeed. Another thing I think is worth mentioning is the increase in people's incomes in rural and urban areas. Last year, the growth rate was 7.4 percent against a GDP growth rate of 6.9 percent. The public has shared the reform dividends and harvested a lot of real benefits. The employment market also fared well. Last year, 13.12 million new jobs were created for rural and urban residents. Such an achievement is very remarkable compared with the developed countries. It would be quite a job for Americans to just add 10,000 to 20,000 new positions for urban residents. For countries as populous as China, our achievement is for the world to see. What are some of the prescriptions to change the system, not just fix the, the short term, but change the, the whole system so that that does not happen again? Number one is the government not chasing higher GDP growth anymore. The GDP growth will not count as a key indicator for evaluating yeah, right. <laughs> the, 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 right. the, the local government. Yeah. Right? And that will not count anymore. Number one. Number two is what we call the let the market decide. That means the banking, now more and more private banking coming, and the banking is more in their own fit. They even mm. they're losing money. And now we have a we have a deposited insurance companies. So if you were do not well, close it down. Okay. We have insurance, so we're not right. worried about the people run off bank. <coughs> right? And uh, so in in that sense, we try to reforming uh, this economy. Um, we then have a lot of a new policy coming. What we call new new term is called a supply side the structural uh, uh, reform. Structural reform. Supply side structural reform. So explain yeah. that term <laughs> and explain why it is uh, occurring now and what are the components. Right. And now the new term <coughs> everybody talking about that is a supply <coughs> side uh, structural reforms, right? And that more in the economists familiar, uh, the general <laughs> public do not understand what do mean supply side, right. everybody supply side, right? right. And, and this one, in, in fact, that if you're chasing the rules and can uh, can be in 1980s uh, Reagan's economy, yeah. we call the supply <laughs> right, side right, economy. Right, right. And not 100% the same, but there are some related. <coughs> the supply side basically is mm -hmm. uh, we should be reduce our capacity, right? Now, what we said, the government intervention for overcapacity, this is number one, so the capacity coming. And government also have an intervention, do not allow to reduce the capacity, uh -huh. because the local government still worry, <laughs> right. right, and oversupply it. But the local government worry if uh, people I do not have a job, sure. right? So they still using different influence, do not allow mm. those, those enterprise to reduce, the cap uh, reduce <laughs> the production or close down and bankrupt, but now, the government policy is a supply side the, uh, structural reform means if our capacity 
if it needs to close down, close down. And that's why this year, the government prepared, central government prepared what, 100 billion yuan. So for we reserve 100 billion yuan for those people losing job. We can give a little bit of subsidies, we can give some retraining, that one. Not using this as an excuse, say that we're not closing down. Right. We're not uh, That's really bankrupt. Yeah. Right? So supply side of the economy, number one, is really from that part. That if you need to close down, closing down. Okay. Right? This is number one. Number one. Number two is Chinese have a huge demand. In fact, that you can see in recent months, you can see all Chinese overseas purchasing, <laughs> overseas buying, right? The, those people, uh, tourists, and they buy a lot of things, they abroad, a lot of luxury goods. That means for the domestic demands there, the problem with all supply is not fit of demand, or quality, Chinese quality mm. Mm. is not good, the variety is not good. So if that's the case, all demand that come to abroad is not buying domestically. And this is not only Chinese demand, also global. And, uh, and Chinese goods, many, many Chinese goods are low quality and give a very bad <laughs> <laughs> reputation in the world market. Right? So that the supply side. Uh, Improving quality. Yeah, improve our own production okay. quality. Okay. Not only quality, also variety. We have to address okay. those uh, demand for that. Good. And third part, this one is we use a internet, new innovations, what we call the innovation and the uh, internet, uh, plus. internet plus, uh, a startup and so on. So because we happen to be in a new industrial revolution period, a lot of new things coming. And the supply side is that we should, the third part is increasing support to those innovations, internet plus and those parts. So hopefully with these all three measures, and yeah. things that, will that's change. excellent. Is, is there a fourth? <laughs> yeah, of course. Is, is there a fourth part as well that I've heard that talks about making it easier for companies to do business through uh, reducing government regulations and red tape, and also decreasing uh, corporate taxes, so that the companies have more money with which to invest in uh, market-driven uh, decision making and allocation of resources. So is that a fourth category? Uh, this is the, yeah, it can, can be a fourth category. And uh, this part already, not only now, actually in the past uh, three or four years, uh, three uh -huh. years already, this is uh, uh, already done. Uh, but not done, this is uh, ongoing, still mm -hmm. ongoing. This year, government particularly expanding half a trillion for fiscal deficit. Yes. And we increased, uh, Fiscal deficit for three percent of GDP, and before from two point four or something yeah, yeah. two point three. So that's a big. Difference. But why increase that part? Yes. Large proportion is we want to reduce our tax, the corporate tax, right? And very corporate tax so reduce the burden for that. Macroeconomic policy adopted in China really have this specific target to maintain sustainable balance. The strong growth. So that's uh, it's important. That uh, policy must be reflect the market reaction. Also, this policy should be tested by result. China's exchange rate won't see a huge depreciation, and there is no need to devaluate the yuan to boost exports. For the job market, unemployment remains within the reasonable range. I think in supply-side reform, the key is to get rid of unnecessary capacity, and that is even more difficult than destock inventories. It requires joint efforts from both the financial sector and local governments. We could learn from the experience of reforming state-owned enterprises and state-owned banks in the past. The government's guidance on the supply-side reform will effectively encourage companies to innovate. The government should do more to support companies on technology innovation, for example, by cutting taxes and by streamlining bureaucracy. 
that will make the market play a decisive role in resources allocation, which will benefit companies as well as to make them more competitive. As you look at the world economy and the globalization and China's engagement with the world, what should um, of, of, of foreigners who look at China consider in terms of the importance of the Chinese economy for their economies? I think it's, it's not true, right? In fact, uh, this is the beauty of a market economy. And the, this is, a, as an economist, we get a training of uh, the market econ economy is good, right? The free trade is good, <laughs> and this is all argument. There are always uh, people against it, no doubt for that. Right? Um, in China, we should pay attention that the China, the new China, I said the next 10 years, 20 years, and we will have a more contribution to the world economy. Be before, China is the, the with, with the, uh, related with the world market, mainly for export. Yeah. Some import, but larger export, attract foreign investment. And that part, there are always a, a group of people that are happy about that, <laughs> right? And the, the capital reduced, and then the, the goods coming, competition, all that. But you can see that next 10 years, the, the, the trend in China is China start to largely invest abroad. Will China become a capital surplus country? We have too much savings, right? And local market is not big enough. Or entrepreneurs before, we cannot compete with the market. Now gradually they are confident coming, mm -hmm. they, they're willing to invest abroad. So you can see the next 10 years, the, the, the new character of a Chinese economy, you can see a lot of Chinese companies invest abroad, creating jobs. And abroad, right? And uh, and that part, I would say that's a more positive or more contribution to the world economy. Mm -hmm. And uh, but ag again, this is a learning process. Maybe some entrepreneurs they do not pay much attention to the labor unions' uh, rights, and uh, maybe pollution, they are the, 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 the environment uh, not in the standard, but they can learn quickly. But overall you can see that uh, um, Chinese will invest much more in abroad than the foreign investment to China. And China more engaged to the world economy. I'm amused that purveyors of the China collapse theory are often advocates of the China threat theory. How China could threaten, which requires power, at the same time it collapses, which reduces power, is a mystery to me. Yet China's problems are real. As China's legislative and political advisory bodies this week confirm, because issues have become so complex and interrelated, they must be addressed in parallel, not in series. Analysis must be dispassionate, monitoring continuous, and decision-making resolute. When new measures do not work, such as tight circuit breakers on stock market volatility that fueled rather than doused anxiety, they are corrected rapidly. Two factors drive the China collapse theory in the global eye. First is that world markets have come to depend too much on China's growth. China is still a developing country and cannot alone bear the world's burden. Second is that China's increasing cloud generates a natural backlash. Market economies run in cycles, measured over years. China's economy will cycle, but it won't collapse. China's success is the world's success. That's closer to China.